an awful lot to talk about uh, with you this morning. Let's go crack straight on. Uh, let's talk, first of all, about this amazing rollout that we've seen of the vaccines. I mean, it is extraordinary, those facts and figures I was giving in my opener, um, that we are seeing uh, you know, just so many people getting vaccinated, 1% of the population in one day, for goodness sake. Lots of people will be expecting, well, that will mean rollout. We're going to hit all these deadlines mid-February, all the vulnerable. That's it. We can start easing uh, uh, our, our restrictions and get back to some semblance of normal life. Lots of words we're getting from scientists, from SAGE, nurses, of tack. Uh, Matt Hancock himself, a tough few months between now and summer, he says. Many restrictions until late spring. Some are saying even throughout the rest of the year. Um, do you think that we will still be in that position? Do you think the government will do that? And do you think the British public will put up with it? Well, I think there's a whole series of <laughs> connected questions there. If I just start by what is it that we, I think we need, what we need at uh, very soon is a clarity about how we wind down from lockdown uh, and when we would start that. And I think uh, the government's talked about being able to give that information um, you know, in late February, early March. Uh, that's important because businesses have got to plan. For example, if you run a, a pub or something, you don't have any stocks. You can't hold those stocks. You've got to order them. And then the business, the, 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 those who are the brewers have got to start making it. Uh, and they're not going to start making it if it's just going to sit and go off. So what they have to do is time all of this. So these things need lead time sometimes of three and four weeks before they're able to open their businesses. So number one, we've got to give them that sense. Number two, I think it's, look, the key thing is once you've got the vulnerable covered, uh, it is feasible for you to start relaxing. And I think the, even the prime minister has suggested that. Um, I think what the scientists are doing when they come out and say, oh, we must have restrictions, restrictions, what they're, they're worried about is that people will take it into their own heads that they know when to start easing and so they're worried that people will think oh well people have been vaccinated now we're all right we can all go back to meeting in homes and things and that's where the key spread is so the government though has got to now start giving people something to look forward to i do note that the uh, the health secretary matt hancock said the uh, other day i think the last couple of days that we can look forward to a a, a, a normal proper good british summer uh, with the relaxations all off. There's a little bit of dispute in the government over this because I see that the uh, Trade Secretary said you shouldn't be saying that sort of thing. So, But also, but I, can I, I just say, we, we were looking were... forward to back to normal by Christmas as well, or back to normal by Easter. We've had a lot of people in government saying these things. It doesn't seem to often come up. The key thing I think a lot of people are worried about, people who, unlike me, did actually think that this would be one last push, a few weeks lockdown. I've said beginning of this lockdown, this will be for months on end uh, and, and there there is no route out, which is one of the reasons we've, we're pressuring it because there will always be, you know, a new variant, a new uh, a, a new call for, you know, we, I mean, some of these medics do seem to think we're going to go for zero COVID. I mean, which is genuinely a sign of insanity in my view. Uh, um, but, but the goalposts keep being moved. It was, we're going to roll out the vaccine when the most vulnerable who die, most far most likely to die of this, this disease are vaccinated, then we can start going back to normal then it became once hospitalizations also go down then it became once we know that there isn't further transmission then it became you know uh, the the risk of there you know being new variant then it, the goalposts are being moved all the time aren't they and when people talk about this carrying on forever or all the rest of the year even Jonathan Van Tam uh, was saying a few weeks back about us we're maybe wearing masks you know for every winter there are a lot of people and they're, they're, we're not people who believe it's a hoax or it's a conspiracy theory or any big you know global plot but that there seem to be an awful lot of people in charge of health policy right now who who effectively the power has gone to their head and they seem to think that we should somehow control the population and create a new normal where we wear masks we don't see each other in winter and that this is going to become the normal i don't want this to become the normal i actually don't think it will become the normal because i think the public and no matter what the polls tell us Actually, if you look around you on this particular lockdown, you will see for yourself that actually the public has kind of made decisions about how they operate their lives. And it's not like the first lockdown. The first lockdown, I remember having to go to Parliament and frankly, you know, it, the roads were just clear. Um, there was nobody on them. Now it's more like, um, which it is exactly, it's more like when you drive and the schools aren't back, they're on holiday. So it's at that sort of level, I think. Um, I think probably 60, 70 percent of where the, 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 the roads are. And that's people going to work, many of them having to do important jobs in uh, areas of health, but also lots of people in construction and various other things. So, so the, um, this lockdown isn't like the last lockdown. I think the public kind of making a balance of this. What I think 
the scientists are trying to do is to say, look, you know, don't suddenly start making plans uh, and then decide you're going to change everything in the next few weeks because we still haven't uh, managed all of that. And COVID's going to be with us for decades to come. I mean, Spanish flu back in 1918 is still with us. It comes back every year. It's just that we now have uh, created a kind of internal immunity to it. So it has very little effect. So these viruses do stick around and hopefully, and I believe, get less less virulent in terms of how they are. And even with the new strains, you know, for all the talk about them being damaging, in truth, there's no evidence that they're more virulent. What has caused the problem in this this period, which is, I think, changed the terms of the game from last year, is that the, 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 the transmission rate of uh, of the v- a virus that uh, mutated in Kent, that has definitely created the greater pressure on the health mm-hmm. service uh, because people are catching it quicker. Yeah. Uh, and that means they're in hospital. Uh, well, we know, more. I mean, uh, not only have infection rates gone down, they fall on 32% uh, in mm. a week uh, in the latest figures. Hospital admissions down 29% in a week because we know fewer people going into hospital uh, and, fewer, and fewer people actually in hospital overall. However, people who are very sick with COVID need a lot of treatment. We know many of those are very elderly. A lot of people who are younger actually very, very obese. 48% have a BMI over 30, 11% have a BMI over 40. And we are talking about very obese people. That makes them have, they have a lot of extra complications and a lot of the issues of dealing with them, needing, you know, six nurses to to help you know, turn a patient over and things. They're very, very work, labour, staff intensive, uh, which is creating problems. But should we still have a country that remains in some semblance of lockdown? You can call it tier four, tier three or lockdown. Same difference to most people whose lives are devastated by it. If the hospital are still saying they are, in quote, unquote, overwhelmed. Should we still remain in lockdown or, or should we just really get our act together as a nation and build up hospital capacity? Well, the first thing I think we need is we need the full and correct figures published regularly uh, about hospitalisation, about ICU occupation, uh, about the numbers of staff that are absent and also uh, about the numbers of treatment that are being carried out that are not COVID related cancer treatments you know, dialysis, all these sort of things. I think we have to be completely open and publish all of those figures so the public themselves can see where it is. I I think we are on the downward slope now, uh, definitely, in terms of uh, hospitalisation, infections, and, as it turns out, uh, deaths. So this is coming down. It's, It's still reasonably early days on that. But I think, you know, the key thing is the public really needs to know what the situation is. There's no question that the vaccine rollout, which is critical, it's the answer at the end of it all to all of this. So the more people we get vaccinated. But uh, the key thing is the government committed by mid-February to have all of those at-risk groups vaccinated. Uh, and the one thing we've learned from all of this in the last 12 months is that, frankly, we need to be fitter and uh, we need to watch our weight. I mean, it's a yeah. reality, it's, I'm afraid. Yeah, you can't generous. help getting old, but you can help uh, getting fatter. Um, let me ask you just also finally about two big stories, obviously, of what happened on Friday with the European Union um, is extraordinary uh, as triggering, triggering of uh, Article 16 of the Northern Ireland Protocol imposing yeah. that hard border, backtracking, the blaming of the UK because the EU did a very late and very poorly written contract with AstraZeneca for their supplies. Um, what, as a, as a leading Brexiteer, what was your take on all of that? Well, I wrote a piece about this for the Sun yesterday to explain that I thought what happened, what we saw, forget for a second it was even about the vaccine, What we saw from the European Union, I think, was a characteristic uh, easy anger at the UK. So what we've witnessed all through the negotiations uh, uh, since the signing is this idea that somehow the UK has to be punished for having the temerity to have left the European Union. And I thought this very much characterised the European Union's response. For example, when they attack AstraZeneca, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, again and again, they referred to it as the British company. Uh, It was a kind of became a surrogate for anger with the UK, and particular anger because the EU hated the idea the UK having left the European Union was actually quicker off the mark to get these vaccines bought and uh, dealt with. And this is something which was intolerable. So what we saw colouring their judgment was animus, uh, a personal animus to the UK, which I think has done them a lot of harm, and I think shocked many of those uh, in other countries. But there is and has been a tendency to always poke at the UK. For example, the, the mutation was described as by the German Chancellor as the British virus. Well, hold on a second. We say the South African or the Brazilian variant? Yeah, well, it was referred to as the British virus. It's a mutation, for goodness sake. The idea that a country is to blame 
uh, any country is to blame for mutations. It's just ridiculous. They happen all the time. And then we have Mr. Uh, uh, President Macron with his ludicrous uh, statement about how somehow uh, AstraZeneca it, it doesn't work on over 60s. I mean, that deserves a big raspberry, but the most important part of it, it hid the reality that they were trying to manage demand in their own countries. And what do they do? They kind of blame the British. So the truth is, I think this may change their attitude and uh, maybe they will decide now to grow up and accept the fact the UK has left and work with us on these things. But the UK, I think, did the right response, which was not to shout, scream or to retaliate but just be reasonable. Uh, yeah, I have to reason. say. And just finally, just one a brief word, please. Uh, obviously, the very, very uh, worrying news that Captain Sir Tom Moore, aged 100, obviously mm. the hero, the, just the man who's really kept us going through the whole first, and it's first lockdown with his magnificent money uh, raising efforts for charity. Uh, he's in hospital. He's got pneumonia. He's also tested positive for COVID. Your thoughts to, on uh, Sir Thomas Moore today? Well, I'm, you know, like everybody else, I will uh, pray that for his uh, health. Clearly, you know, he's 100 years old and, uh, you know that he's he's not his body's not as strong as it would be. But um, there's something about uh, uh, Captain Tom uh, that I think exemplifies what I think is the best of British, which is this stoicism and this sense of just general quiet determination. You know, uh, the belief that everybody has it within them to be strong and a heroic figure, but without ever demonstrating it or arrogantly strutting around and and pro uh, and professing your own greatness. The truth is. Captain Song, uh, Tom, has shown us what we should be doing, which is to stand firm, get on with our lives and make sure all the way that we look after other people. I think that's just worth more than I can possibly say.